Hey, my name is Matt Storr, and I repair saxophones for a living. Uh, today, I would like to give you a quick look at a uh, rather interesting and sometimes rather confusing saxophone. This is the LeBlanc semi rational saxophone. Um, this horn has not been overhauled yet. I'm not sure whether I will overhaul it or not. This horn is currently in the collection of getasax.com. And depending on who buys it, uh, they may buy it as is, or they may buy it uh, overhauled. And if they buy it overhauled, then I'll get to do the work on it and I'll do a follow-up. But given that these horns are uh, pretty rare, and you hardly ever see them uh, in shape this good, considering this has not been uh, really touched, I had to and, like push out a couple dings or something like that. Nothing very big deal at all. Hasn't been cleaned up, except for the engraving, which I polished up a little bit so you could see it. Uh, but considering how rare these are, I figured I should probably uh, take advantage and make a quick video so you guys can see. Now, the main thing that confuses people about these saxophones, okay, there's three main types of saxophone that people uh, confuse that LeBlanc made, and they are the LeBlanc Rationale, La Rationale, L-E space, R-A-T-I-O-N-A-L-E, uh, the semi rationale and then the LeBlanc system and they go in that order the rationale was the first one made uh, and it had the most complex key system and then came the semi rationale and then it kind of simplified and uh, some might even say refined into the LeBlanc system which you see on uh, sometimes horns marked LeBlanc and they've got really beautiful engraving says LeBlanc right here um, Sometimes they're on veto instruments. And the easiest way to tell the difference, okay? This looks very similar to a LeBlanc rationale, okay? Most of this looks the same. Uh, the pinky table looks the same. The octave mechanism looks very similar. The main thing that's going to tell you, two main things are going to tell you whether you've got a rationale or a semi-rationale. On the rationale, you've got three keys here on your E flat C pinky cluster, okay? Boom, boom, and then boom, one here, okay? Also, this engraving will be different. Sometimes it'll say LR, which this almost looks like, which makes it even more complicated, or it might just say La Rationale. Now this one has an SR. And you could, th and you might think that that means like system rationale, uh, or that could even look like an LR maybe, but that is an SR, semi-rationale, and it's even easier to see here on the serial number, SR, semi-rationale, and that's the serial number, 215. These are not made over a very long period of time. Um, the main thing that's really interesting about this saxophone is that the keywork was designed with the ideals of Theobald Bohm in mind. Uh, and that is, on a normal saxophone, there are several different places where you've got an open tone hole uh, followed by a closed tone hole, and that can end up giving you a stuffy note. Uh, the idea with the rationale was that there would always be an open tone hole or a series of open tone holes below the last closed note. And for the most part, on the semi-rationale, that is true, except for on E, where you've got the D tone hole is open, and then you've got two closed tone holes. Um, also, you can see you've got some extra trill keys going on here. You've got uh, your high F sharp right here. Uh, an octave mechanism that really, I mean, from the point of view of a repairman, it works really well, but it also seems like it was designed by someone who hates repairmen. Uh, it's very easy for it to go out of adjustment. When it's working, it works great. And that's actually pretty indicative of the whole horn. Another thing that's really interesting is that for the notes, in the left hand, in the upper stack, C sharp, B, A, um, and G, of course, will lower by a half step by pressing any of these keys, okay? So you're playing C sharp, all open. You press this, you get C. That's a half step down. You're playing B, press any of these keys, you get B flat. You're playing A, you press any of these keys, you get A flat, also known as G sharp. And then of course you press, you press G, and you press one of these and you get G flat, AKA F sharp. So that's a pretty interesting thing that you can do to trill from A to G sharp, just like that. 
And you'll notice that the key work is rather complex, the way things work together. Um, and that uh, can be, well, it, it is, honestly, it's very difficult to, to work on. It just takes time. If you're ever going to work on one of these, assume you're going to take twice as much time as you would on a regular overhaul for a horn in similar condition. Um, so there was the rationale, which is mostly like this, and then the semi-rationale, which was a slightly uh, simpler version of the rationale, and then the horns you see most often are the LeBlanc system, and the easiest way to tell those is that the keywork works very similarly, but you've got arms going over most of the keys with screws in them for adjusters, and that's what connects all the keywork together. Rather than on these, there's like these little tongues, um, it's kind of hard to see. There's one right by my thumb there. There's like these little tongues that get activated that make keys work together. And on the LeBlanc system horns, there's just arms with screws over each of them. And it's pretty easy to see from a distance. Um, another thing you may notice is that the, uh, and actually I'll go ahead and take a key off here and show you the interesting things about the pads, which are also, different than usual. Okay, I hope that this screw is not stuck. Okay, we're doing pretty good. By the way, when you're taking apart saxophones, always undo the screw the uh, springs first. It'll make your life a lot easier. Okay. Also, these key cages are very tight and if they get bent uh, they will restrict the movement of the keys under them. Okay, so we've got, this is what the original pads look like. Um, and if you take a normal saxophone pad of today and compare the thickness, let's see if you guys can see this, and compare the thickness of the pad to the thickness of the key cup and the pad together, you'll see they're about even. And that is because modern pads, of which this is one that measures 0 0.160 inches in thickness, are much thicker than the original pads that were used uh, on the Rationale, Semi-Rationale, and LeBlanc system saxophones. So if you try to use normal pads, they'll be much too thick and they're not going to seat right and you'll have to bend your pads an awful lot. The correct thickness, I believe, is 0 0.140, um, although that is for no adhesive. You'll see here that you've got a resonator and a, what's a funny looking spud here is actually that is a uh, nut and that center portion is a threaded rod that is attached to the back of the key. And I've made myself a special tool for when I have to work on these horns. It's just a screwdriver that I have thinned out so that it'll fit into that tiny little slot and then ground out a middle portion so it'll go over uh, the central threaded portion. Now let's see if I can take this apart and show you how this worked. Sorry to obstruct the view, but you kind of got to go straight on. And there you have it. So there is the little itty bitty nut that came off the top. There's the key with a threaded rod brazed to the back of it. Here is the original pad, which has a rather stiff um, kind of chipboard backing. It's not metal, very thin. And then this is the original resonator, which I'm not going to take off this pad because I got to put it back in and I don't want to rip the leather. And this is very old. This is probably I don't know, 70 years old. So if you look at the thickness of the original pad, compared to a modern pad, and you can see they're very different. And I can actually take out my tools here, take out the calipers, and see what we get for a thickness measurement on this pad. And I'll do it outside of where the... Yeah, so it's measuring out just about 140, I'd say, if I don't compress it. Yeah, right around 140. So that's the thickness of the original pads, but that is with no adhesive. Uh, they would just much like Fisher snap-in pads, you install it, screw it in, and then bend the key cup uh, so that it fits onto the tone hole and seals well. So if you wanted to use adhesive so you could float it a little bit if you needed to, although the 
giant resonators are going to keep you from moving your pads too much, uh, then you would need to custom order pads that are thinner still. Um, and that's what I would do if I overhauled this horn is I would custom order pads, use a little bit of adhesive, at least just to keep the pad from spinning. Um, and uh, install it with the original resonators, um, trying to keep, you know, as long as you've got everything nice and level, shouldn't be too difficult, but it will be more difficult than a normal horn. Um, and actually, I don't know why I'm trying to screw this back on with you guys watching, because it doesn't need to happen. Uh, so that's how the original pads were installed. Uh, another thing you'll notice about the instrument is that um, there are no post feet. The body of the instrument is very, very thick, and this was the same going forward with the LeBlanc system saxophones. Um, that the body is very, very thick, and the posts are silver soldered, not soft soldered to the body. So you can't take these off very easily at all. Um, and if they get damaged, if the body gets damaged, uh, it is quite a chore to get major dent work done on these instruments because the body is so thick. Now, all that said, uh, the interesting things about the key work and how the pads are installed, and these are obviously very rare, uh, they play fantastic when they're in good shape, especially with their original resonators. They are extremely powerful horns uh, with a beautiful tone and uh, excellent intonation. And uh, they're obviously very well built. LeBlanc put a lot of time into building these saxophones. They were not much of a commercial success, uh, so there are not many of them out there. Um, and it's probably one of the things that eventually got LeBlanc out of the business of making its own saxophones, uh, was the, some might say, rather spectacular failure of such a uniquely designed instrument. Um, but if you ever do get one of these in good playing shape, they are just fantastic instruments. Um, but you're about as likely to find one of these in good playing shape um, as something else that's really rare. I can't think of it right now. It's been a long day. Um, and that's mostly it for a quick overview of some major features of the LeBlanc system and semi-rationale and rationale saxophones. Again, this is a semi-rationale, which sits right in the middle, um, but mostly although obviously the difference is going to be very important to collectors, uh, the LeBlanc system plays and is constructed similarly, except just a bit closer to a normal horn than this one is, although the semi-rationale and the rationale horns are much more collectible. But they all play, in my experience, uh, very similarly, and if you get them together, uh, you'll see that the LeBlanc system is basically a much more economically feasible way for the manufacturer to uh, accomplish what they were trying to accomplish with the rationale and the semi-rationale. Um, oh yeah, and these are made, uh, they started in the 30s, I believe the prototypes were made in like 1931, and they were made through the 30s, and then after that you pretty much only see semi-rationales every once in a while, uh, and then mostly from the, I believe, you know, mid-40s until the 70s uh, is the LeBlanc system. And there isn't a whole lot of information on these out there, which is why I don't have specific dates and serial numbers to give you. Uh, but um, hopefully this information will help anybody looking around and trying to figure out the difference between the three different types of horns and wondering what one of these looks like, wondering what they play like, and wondering what the um, things they need to watch out for as far as repair are. And again, I would say budget, you know, twice as much time if you're a repairman and twice as much money if you're an owner of one of these instruments to get it repaired properly and you're going to need to custom order pads. So that's it. Hope my, uh, hope this was uh, enjoyable, informative, interesting. My name is Matt Storr. I repair saxophones for a living. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, please feel free to get in touch. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks for watching.